more will host the Cakewell Cafe this month, September 2022. And we have with us today our very special guest, Matthias Borg, uh, who we had the pleasure to meet in person two weeks ago at the Workplace Ninja Summit that took place in Lucerne, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, let me do a little bit of marketing. Next year, we'll be hosting this event again. It's uh, a live uh, physical event. And if you're interested in joining, I'll share the details later in the chat. So our agenda, uh, in all fairness, uh, Johnny and I were, were quite busy with work and with conferences. So um, there's, there's not too much about what's new, uh, but we'll definitely repeat um, what we demoed at our presentation at the Workplace Ninja Summit. We then have our guest, Matthias. And last but not least, there's always something take well. So yes, we'll definitely share something we've been doing in the last couple of days uh, with take well. So what's new? Well, it's not really what's new in take well in terms of a new function or an operator, um, but I wanted to highlight uh, uh, a new initiative that uh, the uh, Azure uh, Data Explorer team launched, uh, and it's called the KQL Detective. Um, and it's yet another resource to help you learn and understand uh, KQL, uh, but also practice uh, KQL, uh, this time not in Log Analytics or in Microsoft 365 Defender, but basically you get the opportunity totally free of charge to run all your experiences in a free data explorer uh, environment. Uh, so all you need to do, you go to this URL that you see here, you then will see the welcome page. Then the very first exercise is actually setting up your free data explorer instance. So the very first time, you know, follow the instructions. Um, and when you have, once you have that instance created, and again, it's totally free of charge, yeah, you'll be able to log on to that instance and you can start doing your exercises. And if I'm informed correctly, uh, about every week, uh, they are going to submit a new exercise. So for example, last week, uh, we had the exercise that was related to a library um, so you get all the instructions, uh, as you see here in the sneak peek. You then import uh, the demo data and you'll get a challenge to practice your KQL. Uh, so in this example, uh, you know, you, you import two tables. One is a table with all the shelves that we have in the library. And the other table is with all the books. And unfortunately, you know, one of the books lost its RFID sticker. So your challenge is to actually use KQL and find the missing shelf where the book might be. Uh, actually quite a funny experience. So highly recommend it. And if you like batches, as you can see here, you can also earn some batches to add to your collection of trophies. And with that, I hand it over to Johnny. Oh, already. Let me just jump on because I'm on my mobile now. I'm switching to my computer. Bear with me for just a second. Unless you want to sing a song, Alex, that's also a good idea. <laughs> Are you going to cut that out of the video? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, uh, I can play the piano, I can play drums, I can play guitar, a little bit of bass guitar, but I can definitely not sing. <laughs> okay. And even if I could sing, I'm not so sure you would like my music. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. So I'm going now. Switch. One, two, three. Join with this one. Yes. 
<laughs> you know, you, you know what's super cool? Looking at the attendees, I know one person is here. He's actually on holiday and he's still joining our show. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's really great. Uh, Go now. We can't hear you, Johnny. So now I'm off mute. Yeah. Uh, now you're good. Open attack. This is the main advantage of doing a live session is that there's always something which can uh, change. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the deck. Because we're thinking about doing the scan operator again. So let me share my screen because last month uh, Mike shared a really cool query about uh, using uh, the, uh, the join operator to uh, see some uh, malicious uh, f uh, files or applications being run. So I was playing uh, with the scan operator in my tenant. And then I also came up with uh, something cool. So if you can uh, see my screen. Let's go to hunting. Tab version 12. So what I wanted to do. I have a list of applications or files uh, which I want to uh, report on. And as you can see, I currently have uh, dear.exe, ipconfig, ping, type, uh, almost every of them. Uh, wait, let me admit. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so these are basically the, the living of the land binaries that malicious people make use of right when they try to attack your machine or doing enumeration or you know moving a hack in in their uh, attack right so what happens during an attack an adversary installs or gets the user to install any desk as usual and then from any desk they uh, create a connection and they start enumerating so they start using the net command to see users and groups and uh, everything and once they get more uh, understanding of the network they use ad find and they use the ns lookup and they use these different processes you have mimikatz and rubius for once you want to have some some things with tickets or uh, extracting passwords yeah and the thing is at the moment in my uh, demo tenant and we have on board my laptop and some things i use it quite a lot you, uh, if you map a network drive and in a real environment, this one can get quite noisy. So yeah. I'm running want... IP config and, you know, some of the other commands you, you just mentioned are, you know, legitimate processes, you know, any IT admin, IT admin might, might run, right? I mean, even AD finds, although it's always been put in a corner of being a malicious executable, <laughs> but actually knowing the inventor of this super tool, uh, you know, it, it can also be very handy for, you know, an IT administrator's everyday IT operational tasks, right? So seeing such an executable doesn't per se mean that we have something malicious. Yeah. So then what we'll do is we'll use the, the scanner operator. I will also put in all the, the, the KQL in the show notes. But what we do here is we'll, uh, I only want to see certain columns because if not in a busy environment, you can get a lot of data and your query probably will time out. And then uh, uh, we uh, sort the data based on the device ID and the timestamp because we want to create a timeline. And after that, we use the, the scan operator and to create funnels. And each funnel will get its own ID. 
to uh, put all the data in it. And I want to use several variables from my steps. So the scanner operator does some steps in which I want to see. And then based on the results, it can uh, return the step, the delta between the old timestamp and the new timestamp, the duration between the uh, first one and the last one. I want a dynamic list of all the files being ran and I want a dynamic list of all the commands so I can understand what's happening in the environment. And so, then so over... maybe to, to help uh, people who are, you know, maybe joining the show and not per se familiar with, you know, why we would you actually do that? So uh, as we just explained, you know, running those executables can be totally legitimate. However, running those tools in a specific order or running such commands, you know, within a short time frame is maybe not something that a, a usual IT administrator would do. I mean, running IP config, okay. Running net, you know, dot exe, okay. Now and then, uh, hopefully not too much anymore, but people are still mapping drives uh, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, running an NS lookup and, and doing those type of things. But running all those commands, you know, in a short amount of time, you know, might be an indicator. And that is what Johnny tries to um, actually facilitate uh, with his fake well query here to actually, you know, find those needle in the haystack, you know, that might be uh, suspicious. Yeah. yeah. So over here, I've defined uh, our step. I called it S1, step one. And I want to see if a file name is in suspicious files. Now we can also uh, do that. So, uh, and then next would be uh, if uh, I put step, I fill in this uh, variable, one of these variables as one. So I can later on filter on that. And I want to have delta to be zero because we don't have any delta and also the duration. We don't have any other steps. Uh, files, it will be an array, but it's just one for now. And the command lines also, it's an array, but it's just one. And then what I'll do is I'll summarize it so that I can have it, each funnel ID on its own, each device with device ID as step, and I want to have the, the last record. So when I run this, I get a lot, well, not a lot, I get some step zeros. So over here, I can see a device has run this guy and we have uh, delta zero and duration zero. So what we want to do next is we want to do a bit of copy pasting now. And we want to declare more steps. And get this guy a bit bigger. So what I've done now is I've declared some more steps. I have step one, step two, three, four, five, and what I did is also I did a, uh, I'm getting the time period now, and I also want uh, the device ID to match between the funnels because sometimes at a certain moment, uh, there can be like five funnels because five different devices start at the same time. And then I've declared the same steps uh, for step three, four, and five so that you, uh, can see if something happened multiple times. So, and I, what I've also done is I've created a, a threshold and a time period value so that you can play around because usually my threshold with three works out pretty well in different environments, but it can be that, uh, you know, you have a lot of legacy batch scripts which do crazy things and you need to have them. So then maybe you want to put it at four. If your environment isn't that noisy, then you put it at two. And I've also uh, made a variable for the time period of five minutes, which I use here. So uh, there should be a limit of uh, five minutes per step. So if one uses a net stop and then with five minutes, they do the deer and a ping and the other commands, then it will register it. So 
now what we see is that uh, some of these funnels got at one, at step two. And if we sort it backwards, we see also that some came at five. So when we open this, you see over here, these were the five executables which have been ran. And with these uh, command lines, so we know that which commands have been executed. So you can uh, create this. You can also uh, create it more, uh, more steps so that you can even dig deeper. You can also say, hey, I want uh, where step is uh, greater than or equal to thresholds. And now over here we see that there are uh, 56 records with a step of greater than three. And as you can see at the times, there were several moments where I was playing in my environment. And this way you can uh, uh, look at uh, data to see if you see any uh, specifics. Also, one of the things which I did in this query is that I uh, don't want uh, over here at this bit, I say, hey, I don't want my current process command line uh, be in the process command line of step one or of step two. And that way I uh, prevent from having duplicates. So if an admin does an NS lookup for the exchange server three times, I don't want to get an alert. And I can use these uh, uh, these steps to make sure that we exclude as much as possible. I also do uh, make a pack of the file names which have been run. And I created also a pack of the command line so that uh, you can review uh, things that happened. And for instance, if we wanted to create a step six, we go step six our file name is suspicious files timestamp minus timestamp five should be less than the time period which we set to five minutes uh, device id should match the step five one so we're still in the same page command line shouldn't be equal to s1 s2 s3 s4 and now we can add S five, and we're at step six. Delta is timestamp minus S five. Duration is timestamp minus S one. Files one, two, three, four, and we also want to have the fifth one. Command lines goes the same. We also want to make sure we have the fifth one. Space. Step five. And now. We see there's also some occasions where we got to step six because I ran commands multiple times. And uh, as Mehmet explained uh, some versions ago, what this operator does, it looks, it actually starts at the last step to see, hey, did this happen? And then if it happens, then it will populate all steps. And in the end, it will look from above to see, hey, we got a match from step in this funnel from one, two, three, four, five, six. So it works from the bottom to the top, and then it will uh, do everything. Over here, you can see that the duration from the first one to the current step is, in this case, it's uh, 1 minute 36. And the limit, of course, because we have six steps times five minutes would be a 30 minutes block. Uh, and where... I guess you can also do the opposite because some adversaries actually go slow intentionally, right? 
so to remain remain under the radar. Uh, so you could potentially also look at this over a longer period of time, right? And Mike has a question: Were there duplicates in the file names? And yes, there can be. So if you look at this funnel, then over here I did uh, I did net view, net use, net user, and net local group, which all used uh, the net command. So there can be uh, there can be duplicates. But uh, yeah. wait, uh, did I filter that then? Uh, OK, so I only uh, made sure I didn't got the exact same process command lines. Yeah. So you can also do uh, if you wanted, you can also uh, add another couple of ants for the for the file names. But that depends on your use case. And for me, it's nice to know that you have multiple uh, commands, uh, but you still want to see all the different uh, uh, commands, so executables, same commands can be different. So that makes sense. So and afterwards, we'll also put this one in the show notes. It's it's quite easy, and you can also use the scanner operator for a lot of things. Because now I'm using it for this, but you can also uh, have situations uh, where uh, I don't know, you receive, for instance, the Bumblebee now, you receive an ISO and the ISO uh, got extracted and then it opens a link file and then the link file uh, impacts a DLL and the DLL gets loaded. And those five steps you can also uh, use to, to detect it. And then if you declare all five steps and if something happens, then you'll get an alert. So you don't have to trigger on file names or on really specific items. So that's the, the, the scan operator revisited. And uh, thank you, Mike. Oh, that's that one. Yep. And now we got Matthias. All right. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and um, yeah, we, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, on uh, uh, <laughs> what the topic should be. And uh, we have uh, had a few um, options. So I think, and I came up with another thing that I'm, I think it's uh, it's good uh, to share. Uh, and also I want to, I don't want to go back to to what you said, Johnny, about the uh, look for specific file names or specific uh, folder path and, and stuff. Yeah, those are really good in maybe tracking a specific adversary and uh, map it against a specific adversary. Uh, uh, the challenge with that is that um, uh, you will miss too much. Uh, and instead, as uh, Johnny explained, uh, looking for uh, the events that can't be changed. Um, uh, specific order of executions, image loads, and so on and so forth that can be used for this. Um, yeah, so uh, let's uh, go on. And I think this uh, uh, this headline, where do we start or how do we start? Uh, I, th I think that sums up a little bit um, uh, with regards to um, starting with threat hunting and how to get it to work in your organization. I'm not sure if um, at once. Um, attending this call if uh, uh, are they working with a threat hunting program and, and so on. Um, um, but it's very easy to just jump into the data because you have so much data if you're using um, your SIEM solution or if you're using uh, Defender, T65 Defender, uh, there's so much data. Uh, but I want to go back another step just to um, in your uh, and define your threat hunting program. Where do you want to be in the next coming three months? Where do you want to be in six months and so on? So you set your goals in so you can actually see that your program is making some effort and uh, uh, working towards these goals, um, which ties a little bit uh, to the threat hunting maturity uh, um, 
oh, sorry, uh, threat hunting maturity model, um, which is um, um, well defined. I can can paste the uh, the link to that in the chat. Um, and I think that's it's an important step to see where you are today. How can you improve your threat hunting? Um, and what do you achieve? What are you uh, what are you trying to detect uh, with the program and so on? Um, the the maturity model is divided into um, uh, to five different uh, sort of pillars where you have um, uh, the lowest level HMM zero and then up to HMM four. Um, if we go on the uh, if we start with the um, uh, the starting point, so to speak, um, you have your automated alerting, but you don't have your um, you have a little or no data collection and um, that part increases for every step. Um, if we could look at in the middle, we have the um, a very high routine of data collection, and the data collection is sort of the um, uh, uh, the critical part because we need data uh, to look for something. And uh, also, what changes uh, with this model is the analysis pro procedures and uh, how you actually do your analysis. Do you use um, existing ones um, that someone else deployed uh, or uh, developed or are you using uh, like uh, machine learning models and so on uh, i see the question if if i'm showing something um, and i realize maybe this would be something to share um, i'm not sure alex if it is it okay if i share the um, uh, the slides that we did in in lucerne I can't hear you. Ah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Show them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, an easy, uh, easy way of doing it. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, let me just do it like this. Um, very good point. Um, sometimes I, I can explain uh, uh, with a like imaginary uh, visualization. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a good point to uh, to share this. Um, this was a session I did with uh, Safa Hurling uh, on the Workplace Ninja Summit. I think we can do it like this. Um, and Um, if we start with the basics, uh, so let's go back another step. Um, we have the two different options. We have the proactive and we have the reactive uh, part of threat hunting. Um, so the proactive, we hunt for known and unknown threats and uh, some activities, uh, but we're not sure that something is going on. It's, um, and our, uh, one way of working with this is to um, set up themes to work with. Uh, so one week, maybe you hunt for uh, identity related things and the next week you look for uh, device related and um, so you have different goals for a week which makes it possible for you to to really deep dive into the data and uh, especially if you're uh, new to the data you learn so much uh, about the data uh, which you can can become handy uh, if you need to drop over to the reactive part um, so instead of uh, jumping back and forth between different sources um, on the pro on the proactive side, um, uh, I think it's really useful to to really dive into the data and spend some time with it. Um, reactive part, post breach, um, and the hunting that happens as a part of an uh, activity of the incident investigation. It could be that you need to. Um, uh, to dive into some um, uh, initial access part of the incident and see how that spreads and uh, uh, find your sort of end to end uh, incident, uh, regardless of, uh, of what was actually um, alerted on. Uh, so you can see all the bits and pieces that ties into that, um, which is um, uh, uh, really useful for, for some incidents. Uh, and especially if it's a if it's a bigger incident, um, it's good to have this process in place on how you should work and uh, how you can uh, collaborate around this. 
Um, and um, to go back to the uh, that I started to talk about uh, the maturity model. Um, it's all about data collection routine and innovation. Uh, so from um, uh, the maturity model where you are, um, this, uh, the innovation part more or less decides where you are on that uh, on that model. Um, so I have the HMM zero, which is the automated alerting. Um, um, basically, no uh, no data collection, not a, uh, not automatically or maybe not manual uh, whatsoever. Um, on the minimal side, um, we can see that the uh, the data collection is increasing uh, pretty much from from nothing to uh, much more. Uh, and we add threat intel, so we look for maybe known IOCs, uh, checksums, URLs, um, uh, IP addresses, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we continue with the uh, procedure. Um, so do we do the analysis created by others or uh, do we invent our own? Uh, of course, we always need to rely on other people's work. I mean, we, we search for information on on the internet. We, we look for Twitter feeds, um, uh, see, uh, read about new attack vectors and how to uh, how the threat actors are moving in the environments and we look for bits and pieces could be um, uh, commands they're using, tools they're using and so on and how we can sort of discover this in our environment. Uh, and we keep the, the really high uh, routine data collection. Um, on the next part, we, uh, we start with new analysis and we're evolving the analysis, like new ways of detection things, uh, detec uh, detecting things. Um, I mean, one way uh, could be exactly what Johnny mentioned with, uh, instead of looking for specific patterns, um, uh, string patterns, for example, to see if, uh, uh, to look for Conti or, or whatever, um, we could look on the actual events that are being triggered as an effect of these commands, uh, the things that the threat doctors can change. Uh, and that's a way to detect them uh, regardless of if they change um, a folder path or, or whatever, uh, we can still uh, detect them using this method. And on the, uh, on the leading side, um, a lot of buzzwords, um, uh, a lot of automation, uh, we have machine learning models and, and so on. Uh, but I think it's good when, when you start your threat hunting program or if you're in the middle of it, um, define some clear goals. Where do you want to be? Um, let's say the, the coming three months, uh, coming half year and so on. Um, so you can actually measure your progress and make sure that you are getting towards your goal. Um, yeah, a little bit around that. Um, there are some other things I want to share as well. Um, uh, this is um, a full content switching. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Alex or Johnny, if you have something to uh, to add. No, you're all good, man. <laughs> all right. At least we had a pause now between the context switching, <laughs> which could yeah. be good. Um, I started to, to um, uh, dive into, I mean, we have like the increase on MFA, MFA fatigue attacks, um, uh, where the threat actors are, um, are pushing um, MFA requests uh, for the end user. And um, sooner or later, uh, the user will get tired press accept, it could be uh, early morning. Uh, that was something that was used in the Uber attack. Um, uh, I think that's the uh, latest bigger one I read about. Um, it's a very common technique and it's something we can detect on. Um, just wanna, I mean, here a little bit. Um, the, um, there are multiple ways to, um, to detect this. Uh, I mean, one way is the event code. I have it here, the um, uh, 500 one, um, which is the 
uh, strong authentication request and you can look for you can aggregate uh, those events and see if you have uh, a lot of them uh, for each user and um, it's definitely possible to uh, to detect if there are any uh, anomalies in the data um, uh, and you you need to look in your your own environment like if it's a common behavior that the, the users are failing from time to time so maybe put um, uh, put some numbers um, uh, and thresholds in uh, so you're not getting too many false positives um, and I haven't found found like a, a good number uh, to start with as a threshold but maybe 10 15 or something um, that would uh, at least make you pick that up at least uh, but there's another thing in these logs that are really interesting and that's the um, possibility to detect credential leakage um, uh, one part of the MFA challenge depending on how you log in uh, if you only log in using your authenticator app um, as a uh, login method um, it could be that you have username password and also conditional access to um, uh, to see where you are in the world that you're not on uh, these banned IPs or that you're not on uh, uh, or uh, enforce MFA uh, on certain uh, cloud applications um, uh, and something that I, I noticed here on the logs is uh, let me scroll down a little bit uh, maybe I should zoom in um, it's not really rocket science um, but if we look at, at the events uh, so what I did was uh, a lot of testing with um, uh, with wrong username and password and also with a correct username and password uh, to see the difference in the logs and um, uh, there are actually two different um, events being created by this so you can actually see which one are logging in with the uh, the wrong username and password which creates one log um, and then we can see on the next one this uh, conditional access policy is looking at my location uh, and we can see the difference uh, between this we, uh, we have one one event for the um, the wrong username password and one for the conditional access block so on this one we can actually uh, know that um, the person logging in regardless if it's the user or some other um, human in the world uh, actually have the correct username and password so if this wasn't a user um, it could be a result of, of phishing or or something else um, in some way uh, this person knows the username and password which is an important part uh, and depending on uh, where this happens in the world uh, if the user have or uh, in its home country for example and we have logons from some other location we can certainly count on that the user have lost uh, their credentials um, the same thing goes with strong authentication um, so the uh, uh, 500 uh, one to one uh, i think i have it here somewhere um, so authentication failed during strong authentication request this is the one that we can use to um, um, uh, to detect uh, MFA fatigue, but it can also mean um, that the threat actor has the, the valid credentials for the user. Um, if they do have that, do you have application where you not require uh, MFA? Uh, maybe that could be a way in for the threat actor. Um, so this is definitely something to uh, look further on. And um, unfortunately, I haven't uh, pre-created any uh, detection rule for this yet. Uh, but I encourage you to, to look in your environment. Uh, does this apply? Uh, does it work for you? And it also depends on how your conditional access rules are configured. Um, uh, so definitely something worth looking into. Uh, and it's a, a, uh, if it works in your environment, it will be a good way for you to detect leak credential before anyone else knows about it. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and also right. to, to, to fight potential holes in your conditional access uh, setup, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah so I know a story of a business who got compromised because uh, one of the higher up in the management was at the dentist and uh, he got a notification from MFA and the first time he said, ah, deny. Then the second time he denied it. But the third time he was thinking, hey, it's a Microsoft app, so maybe it's supposed to do something. So he allowed it. While being at the dentist in the dentist chair, he actually allowed his MFA because he was thinking it was something from Microsoft, so maybe it should be allowed. Yeah, absolutely. And there's um, uh, also uh, if you if you try something multiple times and it doesn't work, suddenly you will change and try the other option. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I really understand why the, um, the adversaries are really successful with that kind of attack. And I mean, the best option that I can see is to actually change to uh, code matching or something like that. So you yeah. don't only have to uh, to press uh, the OK button to, to to let them in because that could be a really bad move. Yeah, yeah. And and the other feature that recently came out, uh, which I I believe is still in uh, preview. Uh, is actually to include the location uh, to actually show the user where the request is coming from, uh, as well as showing the, the application that is requesting. Um, and of course, this all has to do with end user training. Uh, uh, but yeah, that also can definitely help uh, against this uh, MFA fatigue. Uh, you know, provided users are trained that when they see requests, you know, by PowerShell Exchange app. That maybe they should say no. <laughs> and yeah. Ponte says in the chat, it's a great way of detecting leak credentials. And also, uh, Robert says, if you have identity protection, there are some uh, there are some codes regarding IP uh, malicious IP addresses and IPs associated with password sprays. And I think by mine, it's also something in the fifty thousand series. And there's also one where you have the it was the blocked due to malicious IP address, and it's also giving the same uh, event for uh, wrong password. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also something that could be added uh, depending on your identity protection policy. Um, it could be possible to add the risk level to this as well to make a more certain determination on uh, if this is bad or not. And uh, to some level, you can go ahead and block the account and then uh, take the discussion with that user instead of letting the adversary into your environment. And uh, totally not KQL related, but something from uh, the past PowerShell. Uh, I'm just adding a link. Uh, you know, all those numbers, uh, usually we see within uh, within the locks also the, uh, the description, uh, so it, it's called the result description. Uh, but sometimes, funny enough, it just says other, you know, without any explanation. Although, if you would look up the Azure AD uh, uh, error page, uh, you actually see some explanation. Uh, and for those that have a PowerShell uh, window open anyway all the time, uh, a while ago I, I wrote a little wrapper um, that basically, you know, where you enter the uh, error code uh, and you get the uh, Azure AD uh, number back. I once uh, made a fun out of it and ran a loop for about 10 hours, basically starting from, uh, I think, 1,000 to 100,000. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see what potential error codes there could be <laughs> uh, in Azure AD that I hadn't seen never before. Uh, but yeah, that was quite uh, funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes that kind of research is really useful and gives something at the end, and sometimes it's just fun to do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how, how happy Microsoft is when everybody starts to <laughs> run, uh, you know, endless loops uh, against the uh, potential error codes. But yeah, I, I was kind enough and added a pause between uh, each number of requests. So I'm, I'm not being identified as DDoSing 
the uh, Azure AD and our page. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, uh, let me also add what you mentioned before. I mean, uh, I think it's an important part of, uh, you know, doing KQL uh, is to actually look at the data. Um, and, and of course, you, you need to be a little bit crazy uh, like we are. Um, but yeah, sometimes there are very interesting details uh, in the, within the individual attributes um, uh, of the data uh, that you're getting back. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, really do some analysis. And also sometimes when um, sometimes you run into this uh, property of the data that is uh, right, this looks interesting, but you don't have anything to correlate it with uh, that makes sense. Um, but it could be that you just only don't have that event that you need for that, which could come later. And uh, I mean, it's, it's still worth looking into all the properties that you find interesting, see if you can find any documentation around it. Um, also, try out similar things that you see in the logs uh, to see if you can create something else that you can use to correlate it with further. Yeah. Um, I, th I think, I mean, uh, when developing a new uh, new use cases and uh, the uh, detection engineering part, it's, um, um, I, I think, uh, the absolute best way if you have the option to have a lab environment and test out things and see what actually being triggered. Um, for instance, uh, developing detection on uh, new user creation, for example, and uh, uh, use like a random string. Uh, so you have a string you can look for and see in which table this, does this populate. Um, then you know where where you need to go to to uh, to develop um, a good detection for it, and not only uh, string based and oh, string based or something similar. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, speaking about creating users, there are so many ways how a user can be uh, created. Uh, you know, now with all those provisioning uh, options uh, that you have, you know, when you invite uh, someone in Teams, uh, I, I recently came uh, across the uh, Microsoft Substrate Management app, you know, that is actually the initiator of, of, of certain Azure um, AD operations. Uh, so this is also constantly evolving. Um, and and I, I feel that you really have to be on top of those things. And even if you have a case defined once, um, you know, you have to revisit them. Uh, to give you a clear example, you know, a, a customer about two years ago, um, he, he created a, 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 um, a, a rule that when conditional access policies were changed, uh, and all he had um, in his uh, query uh, was basically, you know, the, the operation type uh, policy uh, and then changed. But meanwhile, we have so many policies. I mean, you know, we have collaboration policies in Azure AD. So those rules, you know, would actually result in false positives because although they named your, the detection rule, like, you know, conditional access policy was changed, uh, looking closer into it, you know, someone just added another collaboration domain <laughs> um, in, in Azure AD. Uh, and that basically means, you know, you also have to revisit uh, and sometimes be, become more precise. Um, also be careful with, you know, just using contains, right? Um, uh, and rather be very specific when you're looking for specific operations. Yeah. Absolutely, and also, I mean, in Defender, uh, when looking for um, for the action times, uh, use the um, the schema reference. Uh, it's really, really great. Yeah, I told you uh, yesterday uh, about my Excel spreadsheet I created a year ago with all different action types, uh, sample queries. Um, of course, I use some Excel functions to create those. Um, but I mapped out all the tables in Trees of Fire Defender uh, with all different options. And uh, then there were some changes coming and um, it, it was impossible to keep up with that. And uh, I mean, a waste of time um, because they enabled the schema reference uh, at your fingertips in the portal. Um, and instead of looking for both the um, uh, on docs and uh, but also looking at the actual event that you have, you won't cover everything, um, but you have everything in the schema reference, um, which is 
uh, I think that's really useful when looking for new uh, potential use cases. And uh, uh, yeah, it's really great having it there. Yeah. Yeah. Although my experience is that the documentation might be sometimes a little bit behind. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if it wouldn't be like that, we would have nothing to tweet, right? Like, oh, I found a new action type. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, uh, you know, in all the rush, uh, we actually uh, forgot to to, to introduce uh, uh, yourself. Um, so tell us a little bit, you know, how do you do KQL in your, in your daily life? You know, is it like once in a while or do you spend a lot of time with KQL? Yeah, I would say I spend a lot of time uh, like every day uh, doing uh, I would say all kinds of things, both um, uh, detection engineering, uh, but also threat hunting. Uh, and I mean, those sometimes are really combined um, combined roles. Um, um, uh, but I try to solve as much as possible. I, I, I saw this T-shirt in Lucerne, like uh, KQL is a new PowerShell. And I yeah. tend to agree. Um, um, and uh, also about learning KQL, um, I started from as we all did in some point uh, from nothing uh, with some SQL experience. Uh, and uh, I had a lot of Splunk experience at the time. And uh, uh, so I needed to learn how to translate it. Uh, but it, at the end, it's a query language and uh, they work very similar to each other. Um, and um, uh, there are some syntaxes that, that changes between languages and uh, somehow you do stuff. Uh, but in general, as long as you know what you try to achieve, then use the documentation and, and or uh, use Google and see how others have, have done it previously. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, at the bottom line, I, I use uh, KQL a lot in, in my day to day job uh, and also on my uh, sort of uh, spare time. Yeah. Um, and you're right about you know the, the SQL background. Um, you know I was lucky enough to to learn Oracle uh, back in the 90s, uh, SQL before there was even an MS SQL uh, SQL. Um, and actually, I, I just posted a link. Uh, so just for for the newcomers in KQL, uh, there's a nice uh, cheat sheet uh, that might help. But but yeah, my experience was also really very intuitive. Uh, of course, nowadays the whole syntax highlighting, you know, does actually help, uh, you know, the online documentation. And, and last but not least, as you mentioned, uh, and I have to admit, uh, I'm still doing that. Uh, I, I even did so with PowerShell, uh, and simply because the day is too short to reinvent the wheel. So basically, when I have something on my plate to do. I would rather first, you know, do a look up. And meanwhile, we know a little bit in which corners to look. Uh, you know, we, we have Matt uh, who, who wrote his 365 days of KQL, um, where, you know, there's a ton of use cases. Um, but, you know, we also see a lot of other people uh, sharing, uh, you know, th their queries. Uh, so, yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot around. Meanwhile, if I look back when I started with KQL, when it was still called OMS, uh, you know, there was very little uh, about it. Uh, but I think due to the fact, uh, of course, probably highly driven by the whole security solution and, and Sentinel. Uh, but what what makes me um, uh, happy is also to see that it's no longer just limited to the security profession. You know, I, I see people who have discovered managing Microsoft Intune. Uh, endpoint manager, you know, that actually, you know, they can do troubleshooting and diagnostic uh, logs um, assessment also with uh, KQL. They can use Azure Monitor to what we call detection rules, you know, they call it alerts, uh, you know, if something goes wrong in, in their infrastructure. So, yeah, definitely <laughs> I, I foresee a bright future uh, for learning and uh, adopting KQL. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, there are some, um, uh, I say some links for translations, uh, which is really great. Uh, there's also the um, the Sigma tool that can help translate from uh, from one uh, 
a SIEM system from Splunk, for example, into to Sentinel language or um, uh, to Sentinel or uh, to Defender. Um, and there's a lot, I actually ran into a website, I can't remember yeah. the name on top of my head, uh, that can do, uh, do this for you. So you can translate and you actually get the, the actual tables in the translation. Yeah, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So that's this one. Uh, yeah. It's called the uh, Unicoder. Uh, so if you are coming from, let's take one, you know, whatever, RDP port forwarding. Um, and now, you know, you have here the Elastic query. And I can say I want to have, you know, where are we? Microsoft Sentinel rule. Right slate. Uh, again, I should see the translation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, a lot of cool tools out there that that help, uh, especially people thinking of, you know, maybe migrating from uh, uh, Splunk to Radar, uh, Elastic. Uh, of course, you still have to think. Uh, let, let me be clear here. You know, it's not like a Oh, you know, I just copy paste everything <laughs> uh, and it will work. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely some handy tools out there. Uh, I also recently found one, but I'll bring that into the next um, uh, uh, KQL Cafe. Uh, although I have to check, maybe I already showed it. There's a nice page where you can paste a lot of uh, uh, hashes and, you know, IOCs. Uh, and you basically say, OK, you know, create a query for me. Uh, with all those hashes uh, or all those uh, executables. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, create uh, that very uh, long query. Uh, and of course, you would rather create a watch list or uh, a lookup list. Um, but yeah, like with everything, like in PowerShell, like in C Sharp, you know, there are a thousand ways to achieve your goal. Uh, some might be more efficient. Uh, but here also, I always encourage people, you know, there's no wrong. Uh, okay, maybe if your credit takes 10 minutes, <laughs> you, you, you might want to improve on the in, in performance. Uh, but in the very end, you know, if, if the query does what you want to do, um, you know, it's fine. Uh, I even, even uh, make the experience myself recently. I've been joining all the time uh, until, you know, I, I, I stumbled. Uh, and how could I miss this? But, you know, uh, the lookup operator. And I thought, hey, you know, the lookup operator is basically doing a join as well, uh, just a little bit differently. Uh, but, it, you know, it's kind of like doing more out of the box for you. Um, actually, maybe a good idea, Chani, uh, maybe next time uh, we, we talk about the lookup uh, operator, because in some cases, uh, you know, the lookup operator can come in handy before I actually do a join. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, in the very end, you know, if, if you get the end result you want, you know, it's all good. Yeah. And it's also depending on your goal, because if you define a uh, a table, uh, maybe in the query itself, then uh, a lookup operator will be better. And if you if you do maybe external data, then you might not want to do a lookup, but you want to do a join. But that's depending on your query and in the end, at first, if the query works, that's nice. And then later on, you can always see how you can make it perform better. Because if you have like 10 records and you have a big query, then it doesn't uh, matter a lot. But if you have a lot of firewall data, for instance, then in the end, you get like 100,000, 1 million, and 100 million records, then you might want to do something with performance. But yeah. to, to start building, then uh, yeah. You can always start with the, with the basics and scroll some data together. There's yeah. another thing with um, um, developing the queries when you have sort of uh, when you have your use case, um, and that is to try to keep it simple um, or at least use comments because uh, it could be that someone else um, um, actually need to read it and understand uh, the result of it. And uh, if you really made it like complex uh, to make it look cool, it 
doesn't give you a thing except a call in the middle of the night to have you explain what you actually did with the query. Um, so that that's also something that's important. It's the same thing with with, with PowerShell scripts. Um, uh, keep it simple. Use uh, variables that can be understood and and so on. Um, I, I think that's a, like a key goal. Also, if you want to do some like knowledge sharing with others, uh, if you keep it simple, it's easier for others to understand and 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 so on. And it uh, make your your own life a lot easier as well. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I mean, if we look at the, uh, you know, Microsoft, uh, Sentinel, uh, and, and Defender, uh, GitHub, you know, uh, where, you know, in the old days, they used the empty, the markup uh, format. Uh, if we look uh, like the uh, open source uh, queries that Falcon Friday is sharing, you know, always with a very good explanation, you know, uh, about the rationale, about the script, you know, also adding information about potential false positives, you know, what you might want to adjust. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I've always gone mad when, when I looked at PowerShell code, you know, uh, even nowadays I see, I see PowerShell code laying around. I mean, you know, the only good thing about KQL is uh, as long as we speak about KQL uh, in Sentinel, you, you, you know, you cannot break something. Uh, on the other hand, you know, depending on what automation you bring in, uh, your bad KQL and bad documented KQL um, now that I think, as I speak, I, I think uh, you could actually break something um, uh, in the sense of, you know, you might be triggering something wrong um, uh, that might then, you know, trigger some automation that you, you wouldn't want to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Anything else, Matthias, you want to share? Um, yeah, well, um, Maybe I broke up my presentation a little bit, but um, um, I work for OneWin in Sweden um, in our MDR service, um, and uh, I do a lot of consultant and um, um, working both uh, Defender and uh, Microsoft Sentinel. Um, secure to MVP. Cool. And happy to join this, of course. <laughs> Any other gotchas you, you want to share from uh, your presentation that you did with Stefan? Um, give me a second. Uh, and of course, for all who weren't able to join. So unfortunately, we, we didn't create recordings um, at the venue because that would have uh, you know made our budget explode. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the presentations are available uh, on the scheduling tool that we use uh, and otherwise, you know, just reach out uh, to Matthias, um, and, and I'm sure I'm not going to make a promise for someone else. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure in one or the other way, uh, you 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 can share uh, bits or pieces from your presentation. Yeah. Absolutely, I can share my email address as well in in the chat window. Yeah. Good. Then shall we continue with the remainder of the show, or did we forget anything, Matthias? You want uh, to? I mean, it's threat hunting. I, I think we three can uh, uh, talk about it for like <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the week. Uh, so yeah. let's move on and uh, we take it from there. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. So. What did we do this month? So my example uh, is actually a uh, customer use case. Um, you're using Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Um, and the end result I'm going to show you um, depends, of course, that uh, you have the Microsoft Defender for Cloud shadow IT logs forwarded. So to do so, uh, you will you will need to go to your uh, Sentinel connector page, select Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps, um, and then you know you see here the MCAS shadow reporting. Good. And um, what that does is the following. Let me uh, make my screen readable for everyone. So that will actually 
help you to feed your discovery logs um, from Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps into Sentinel so that we can query it. And let me uh, go over to a live demonstration. Let me see where did I have that one. Yeah, it's uh, here. So uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, uh, usually we will go here to uh, you know, our cloud uh, discovery. Uh, hopefully uh, we have someone in the company who actually looks at, at those and sanctions them or blocks them. Um, and, you know, Microsoft Defender for Cloud App also has built-in policies that you can create where you could say, okay, you know, if that total number of users is uploading more than so and so much megabyte, you know, raising alert. Now, that's cool, but my customer actually wanted to have something different. He was asking me, well, you know, can I identify users um, regardless of the app or, you know, non-sanctioned app uh, that are uploading a certain uh, amount of data? And again, you know, this is not per se uh, meant for a detection rule uh, and a high alert, uh, but more in terms of governance. You know, and if you want to uh, take a look on whether there's an individual person uh, that might be, you know, leaking more data uh, as usual uh, or uploading data to, to places we don't want. Um, so I uh, took the challenge uh, and the first thing I did uh, that I usually do when, you know, people show me something in the UI, um, and, you know, I, I did the same for when it comes to, uh, you know, missing server patches or, you know, anything else that we can see in the web interface. Um, uh, I, I try, you know, can I get to the exact same numbers? Uh, so in, as a first step, what I did um, is to actually look and say, okay, you know, um, let's take, where was it? OneDrive, yeah. Uh, also be mindful of the time period that you set. Uh, so last uh, 30 days or 90 days. Uh, so let's put this to 90 days. And now I have uh, here, where is it? Yeah, Microsoft SharePoint Online uh, and Microsoft Outlook. So I see exactly uh, those numbers. And what I did basically is to make sure, okay, if I now search for OneDrive, highlight that. Yeah, uh, we see, okay, uh, let's open the details page. Overview. See, okay, I have two users, I have 84 megabyte, I have three IPs and three devices in the mix. Yeah, okay. So now I move over to my KQL, um, to my log analytics, because I've enabled the uh, connector uh, to actually, you know, forward the data from MCAS shadow reporting. Um, and then, yes, you know, make sure you have exactly the same time frame. Um, and also be mindful of the stream that you're using. And this is something in the beginning I was banging my head because I got the data, but not the exact uh, same numbers. Uh, but let me first show you the end result. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, we have uh, four devices, four IP addresses, three users, um, total traffic, upload, and the download. And was that uh, Microsoft OneDrive for Business? What was that the same I showed you? Yeah, and why is it 90 days and here? Also, it's funny, uh, funny because in my, 
in my backup slide I just prepared, I exactly had the, the right numbers ready. So do not lose too much time. Uh, you can run the script yourself. Uh, believe me, it's supposed to work. Let me double check again. Ah, okay. Let's do this. Where F name James one drive. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Uh, 90 days. Uh, Screen 10 iPoint users. And yeah, here we can uh, endpoint users, traffic total 48 uh, megabytes. Let me quickly do this. Switch it. Ah, okay, it was not refreshing correctly. Go to users. Three, three, three. Okay. Upload. Yeah, download it megabyte uh, 38. Somehow it's fooling me right now. This was not supposed to happen, but you know what? I'm just going to leave a uh, few. If you scroll slide. down a bit on the lower right hand corner, I did see about there. So that totals yes, yeah. does approach. But yeah. No, I was even to the point where I, I actually had ex exactly um, the, the the same values. So I'm a little bit puzzled why uh, it, it's not doing it now. Uh, let me give me one more try. Okay. Oh, here's the 84. Yeah, but this is... Um, Okay, now we should be right. Yeah, Microsoft One Guy for Business. We see uh, 84 total traffic, 47 megabytes. And now I'm totally lost because this was the result I had before. And I don't know whether I maybe changed something by mistake that now messes up my query. Uh, and if you anyway. put it on like seven days instead of 90. Well, go back to 90. I have no idea. <laughs> it has been working with all your samples the whole week. Anyway, uh, believe me. Uh, it's working. Probably just have to refresh something. I don't know. Uh, but in the first stage, you know, I got exactly to uh, the same numbers. Uh, and to actually double check it, you know, okay, you know, how many IP addresses, uh, how many devices uh, were involved, um, and how many uh, users uh, were involved. And what I see, which might be the reason. Okay, now I have something. You know, guys, what I did uh, before joining this call, I was just running a uh, a simulation lab in the cloud, and I downloaded a few gigabytes of my Raspberry Pi uh, VM, and I have the suspicion, but I leave that to be commented after, that the reason for having this extreme high number is the following, because that would actually make sense. I uploaded a lot of data from my VM. Um, let me actually show you that, <laughs> just to uh, to prove uh, my excuse. So I, I've uploaded my, my uh, Raspberry Pi VM, uh, which I was running some attacks, um, and I, I you know prepared uh, a zip file and I uploaded that one uh, here, 1.92 gigabyte uh, to my OneDrive to transfer it to my local test machine. And I have the suspicion that this dashboard is not as fresh as the actual um, 
data in my logs. That's correct because what happens, it creates a daily snapshot. Yeah. So tomorrow your numbers will be fine, but for yeah. now it, it needs to refresh. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that might actually also be your reason because with the customer, I looked at the numbers uh, and we also had matches because they are a bank like Fort Knox um, and, and very little is moving happening there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, Use case, you know, this is nice. We have exactly the same numbers, or <laughs> at least, you know, we now know that these are the real numbers. But yeah, this is now by app, but you know, we want to have it by users. So as we uh, discussed before, you know, it's always good to look at the data, you know, what is the data actually telling us? And, you know, then I found um, uh, in interesting information also about the upload bytes, uh, which, by the way, uh, in the um, can you make you know, it a bit bigger? Yeah. Cool. Let me uh, actually uh, just share my uh, yeah. So in here uh, in the portal, you don't see uh, download and upload. Uh, the only thing uh, that you see. Uh, is the total traffic and then the upload traffic. But if you're interested in the download as well, because ideally, you know, um, those two numbers then give you the total traffic. Um, and I found this um, um, attribute called um, enriched user. So I thought, okay, you know, let's do the same by enriched username. Uh, and when I run the query now and I go to upload, yeah. And now actually we see, uh, and this is the funny thing now, um, you know, um, sometimes it's showing me the real name of my tenant, but in this case, I had uploaded the data uh, from my demo machine, uh, and then the enriched username is composed out of the machine name and the local user. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. Um, nevertheless, what we can now do um, is the following. Uh, that is actually the plan. We will now create a watch list. And a watch list will include everything that's sanctioned because we don't care too much about what's sanctioned. Um, and we will then create a watch list and run this periodically, let's say on a daily basis, um, and to identify whether we see any anomalies, you know, of individual users um, that actually might you know, upload data uh, to, you know, cloud. Now, right beforehand, before that question comes, you know, do we see what is uploaded? No. Uh, uh, we could co correlate when we use the endpoint DLP, um, for which we hopefully also will get logs to hunt for, uh, which isn't the case right now. Um, but, yeah, you know, we at least can see that traffic is generated. Uh, but again, we cannot see what data uh, was actually uh, uploaded in terms of file names, um, et cetera. Yeah. Now, be mindful of the following. Um, for those familiar with Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps, uh, when you uh, look at the dashboard, uh, depending on how you actually collect that data, uh, uh, you might have by default a uh, wing endpoint. Uh, which is, you know, I would say the default uh, that if you use your Windows Defender for Endpoint onboarded machines to actually forward the information to Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. Um, but, you know, you might be also collecting your data from uh, a proxy log. Uh, if you use reverse proxy, uh, you, you get additional streams. Um, so what that means is that if I go to and catch that all reporting and I do where I generated let's go ago uh, 90 days and I do a distinct stream name uh, I will find my wing 10 endpoint I also find my continuous report that I tested uh, and my server test. And if you use reverse proxy uh, with conditional access, that is being shown as a separate stream as well. Okay. Um, if you want to overcome that, 
uh, then you would basically have to, you know, if you want to have the global view, uh, you would have within the old portal create a continuous report um, that, you know, includes everything. Uh, but out of the box, what Microsoft Defender for Endpoint does is it creates those views um, based on how the data is actually coming in. So based on the data stream. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that was something where in the beginning when I when my numbers weren't right, you know, I was also banging my head uh, until I started filtering on the stream name in this table. Um, and as we saw, saw before, uh, then you should get it right. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I have been working on uh, lately. Um, and again, you know, lots of fun. Uh, you know, with uh, cake well. And yeah, sometimes I say the, the beauty lays in the simplicity. Uh, so I you know, didn't have to do uh, too much of brain work um, uh, other than, of course, understanding the schema uh, of the MK shadow reporting, uh, which I hadn't used before. Um, now, also afterwards, and sometimes uh, I should do that earlier, uh, I, I uh, actually noticed, hey, you know, if I'm forwarding that, uh, there might be also a workbook, which is very often the case. So in case you are, are using Sentinel, uh, you might also get some inspiration uh, of the KQL queries that are uh, within the respective workbook. Um, and uh, when it's loading, come on. I'm an impatient person. Okay, so workbook, cloud apps. Yeah, uh, here we have the Microsoft Cloud Security Discovery Logs. And if you're interested, you know, in seeing what all happens here, uh, you, know, you can go to the code view um, and take a look at, you know, the queries that are bodied. Um, within this report, uh, or do it the other way, and just look at the report. Itself. And mine is not so interesting because not a lot is happening in my tenant. Uh, but yeah, you know, do a lot. Uh, see the app names, uh, discovery logs, and then you know create your own query or or even enhance uh, your workbook uh, to your needs. Yeah. Good. That's it uh, from my part. Johnny or Matthias, anything to add in terms of what you did this month? Um. Nothing uh, like this up front, uh, but yeah, if anyone uh, want to reach out, feel free to to reach out. Cool. Now, what I did this month was, let me share my screen. So what I was playing with was the, the security events, because it's not always clear uh, which events are uh, causing which kind of load. So uh, while playing with the data, I was first looking at this great page. You have the, the log analytics page where you can see the the usage of a log analytics workspace. But this still, yeah, we can see it's uh, security logs, but you can't see that much. So what I was working on, I was uh, playing with the data and this is a query. Uh, you not might have... What did you say, Alex? You are not sharing anything yet. Uh, other not than sharing. Your oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I am. It should be, but stop sharing and share again. Ah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the the default page where you can see the ingestion and uh, you can see where it's landing, but. It's not giving you that much of information. 
And also, if you look in KQL, this is a query uh, which have been in many blogs at many forms. You have the usage table. And you can see based on the time generated solution security. Of course, we want to know if it's billable. And then you can generate a nice chart, but it's still you don't know exactly uh, or by proxy what it's what it's doing. So I was playing and looking in the, the operators. Let's just have this load for a second. It's not a large tenant, it's a couple of seconds. Okay, so here over here you can see we did some ingestion some days. It was at the limit what was 1.4 gigabytes, so it's not much. But what I began to do, I was looking at the operators and I saw there was an estimate data size. So what you can do is if we um, do it first, let's do the estimate data size right here. Uh, last 30 days is fine. And then we, what we want to see is by events. So with this operator, you can, uh, it, it will estimate the, all the size of all columns. Because over here you can or specify columns or you can uh, tell it, just show it all. You get a result of bytes. So what you can do then with that data, and I also I sorted it by event ID activity and uh, time generated, but you can also of course show it all and also add it by computer. And what I do over here is I do the, the estimated size and then times uh, this number, because at the moment today the the ingestion price for log analytics and sentinel is five euros and 60.6 cents and uh, we, i converted it from uh, euros to uh, part of euros due to uh, bytes to gigabytes so when we run this guy you get the result of the ingestion by event id activity uh, based on days and then uh, per computer and over here you can see that on uh, this specific day, uh, this computer uh, reported uh, firewall allowed connection events and the price of it was eight euros. So you can use this, uh, this operator to estimate the size of the contents and then you can uh, calculate the price of ingestion based on event ID. So you can uh, quite easily see uh, which event IDs are doing much. And of course, you can also run a chart of it. And then instead of event IDs, we want to see prices, of course. And now you can see uh, per day, you can see the, the types of events and the price. So in this case, a uh, handle to an object was closed or uh, where I think this one and this one below. So in this test environment, I don't have a lot of sign-in logs, but depending on your environment, uh, sign-in logs, the uh, 4624, 4625 can uh, generate a lot of events, so a lot of ingestion, but this is an easy way to find out uh, what your ingestion, ingesting, and also you uh, you can uh, tune your environment. So that's uh, what I've been doing this month. Yeah, and that, you know, in general, uh, I'm, I'm a believer that that definitely helps uh, to really, um, you know, periodically look at, you know, what's actually uh, coming in, uh, not only because of the cost, but you know, uh, I mentioned this so often uh, just this morning. I had a lucky new customer onboarded into Sentinel. And, you know, in, pr 
preparation of, of the workshop, they always ask me, you know, who should we invite? And uh, I definitely encourage people always to not only invite the security personnel, uh, but also the IT operation personnel, because uh, I, I believe we, we, we mentioned this in an earlier show, and I also wrote a blog post about it. Sometimes, you know, those outliers um, can be an indicator that something in your environment, you know, isn't right. And not just technically, but maybe a process is completely missing. Yeah. If you see continuous AAD non-interactive signing logs, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, like 10 or 12, but like in the 100,000 of an individual user, practice has shown to me at least that these are the devices that were offboarded, but the user still has his teams running on it. Uh, this is his mobile device because, you know, although it's written on paper, but the unprovisioning process is broken in the company. Um, and yes, that, that, to be honest, in some environments where they have a mess and no process, that really can have a big impact on your lock size uh, if you don't get that uh, under control. Um, you know, even to the point where maybe at some point you might have to think of creating a uh, a D DCR rule uh, that we mentioned last time, where maybe at the ingestion of your locks, you are just going to drop maybe some locks because some objects are generating that high volume of locks you, you might not even be interested uh, in uh, anymore. Uh, but yeah. You know, I, I see various reasons uh, like, OK, delete the user account. Yeah, no, we can't because we have a policy that says we have to keep the mailbox for another five years. So we can't delete the user object. Yeah, things like that. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, the user left the company, but he still has his Intune profile and his Outlook uh, configured. Uh, the user account is blocked, it's disabled, but, you know, the mobile app is still continuously Calling and, and trying to, to to check if he can get email. Uh, contact a user to to offboard himself from uh, Outlook. Yeah, we, we don't have his phone number anymore. We don't know <laughs> how to reach him. Um, you know, these are, these are the real world stories um, that yeah sometimes can have an effect. Um, other case, you know, uh, I I recently uh, uh, did a similar thing as Johnny did here. Uh, I was interested in, you know, what is the most expensive device um, uh, by actually looking at the volume of logs, but also the size of the logs. Um, and, you know, it was one server who had a huge amount of device event, uh, uh, events uh, with the action type of named pipe. Um, and it was totally legitimate, but, you know, for some reason that application seemed to you know, do do a lot with name pipes uh, continuously. So, you know, we immediately saw, you know, this is an outlier. Uh, and I think that can be very helpful in, in understanding your environment um, because maybe to close it, you know, analyzing all the data um, and, you know, maybe also to, to relate to what Matthias was mentioning about the uh, threat hunting maturity model. Most important is that you know your environment and that you understand what is your baseline. You know what are the normal conditions, because only if you understand the normal condition, you know you you can build up your detection on top of that. Uh, because a detection rule where you know port twenty one is discovered, like ooh scary FTP. Well, you know if that is a common thing, that it is running in your environment because you have some business processes, you know, then you might have hundreds of FTP connections. Uh, the question is, you know, where do they come from? <laughs> uh, are they always the same, you know, same duration, um, same user, same device, uh, or do you suddenly see FTP uh, being uh, connected uh, everywhere? Yeah, uh, so it's, uh, it's all about the baseline. At least that's my my theory. I try to spread. Yeah, and the same thing with certain tools being used. Uh, I mean, are these uh, could be uh, potential usage of the tools, um, uh, but they also have a legit uh, usage. Um, so it's important to 
to really understand what's actually being used in, in the environment, what is okay to be used, and also take action on uh, the other items. Yeah. Good. So um, I think we are going to close to uh, stick a little bit to our promise to not make uh, this event too long. Although, like you said, you know, we could talk for hours. Um, maybe we just create a new format, you know, official part, one hour, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but bonus track, you know, another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Matthias, uh, thanks for uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. See you uh, back. Uh, Thank you. Please don't forget to uh, share your private address if you like. Um, uh, because uh, you will get a coffee mug. Um, hopefully that, that works out this time. I, I wanted to order some recently, but uh, it took a little bit too long. Uh, I, I wanted to bring some to the conference itself. And yeah, uh, for all the listeners uh, live or afterwards in, in YouTube, uh, thanks for hanging out with us and uh, hopefully see you uh, next time. Uh, as always, uh, the video in the show notes, it will be there in about three weeks. <laughs> I'm not going to make uh, any promises anymore, but uh, at least we managed to to publish the last video and, and the show notes uh, before we start the next episode. <laughs> I think um, I will manage this one uh, in the weekend now, maybe earlier even. <laughs> yeah, I got full pressure on me. I still have to write the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, happy rest of the week. Happy holidays for those that have uh, that are on vacation. Um, and hope to see you soon back in a month. See you then. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.